Uh, again, I'm Mark Sableman, and I uh, chair Thompson Coburn's Interdisciplinary Privacy and Data Security Practice. I'm an intellectual property lawyer, and I'm here with two of my colleagues who deal with privacy as well, Rob Kaminsky from our Carpet and Securities Department and Mike Duffy from our Labor and Employment Department. We're going to give you three different perspectives on what is happening in data privacy uh, today. I'll begin with the developments in Washington focused on data tracking. Rob will address data breach laws and how to handle them. And Mike will conclude with suggestions on how to address employee and work-related privacy issues. So let me begin with the data tracking story. Um, basically, for 40 years, experts have been predicting that consumers would demand privacy of their data and the lawmakers would enact data privacy rules. Well, for decades, those predictions didn't come true, but a few years ago, Washington began taking a serious look at data privacy, and it all began with something called online behavioral advertising. I love this explanation one of the researchers gave of, of behavioral advertising. It's like you walk into a town and the merchants put a sticker on your back that tells everyone your shopping habits. Uh, Mr. Soltani has his own perspective. He's very pro-privacy regulation, but unfortunately, he's hit on the, a nose, you know, right on the head what, what behavioral advertising is and what it does. Now, behavioral advertising can be used in a lot of different contexts, but the two key ones are first-party behavioral advertising where you track users on your own website and display ads of interest to them based on their browsing activity, and third-party behavioral advertising where ad networks post ads based on, on, on one website, based on browsing habits on a different website, an unaffiliated website. And let me give you a little illustration, very oversimplified. The consumer goes to a website, tra a travel-related website. A cookie is then placed on his website, and it's also made available to an advertising network. So the advertising network knows that that consumer is interested in travel. Well, the next time the consumer goes somewhere, let's say he goes to a phishing website. Well, that first cookie goes with him, and, it all, and, the, and a cookie is generated from the phishing website, so the ad network now knows he's interested in both travel and phishing. And so in my simplified example, the ad network might post a phishing travel-related ad on that website. And that's an oversimplified example, but it happens all the time and there's many different variations. For example, many of you may have read about the MySpace settlement with the FTC that happened yesterday. Well, in that case, it was about behavioral advertising. Third-party advertisers would get the friend IDs, kind of a, more than a cookie, of the uh, viewers of, of advertising on MySpace pages. They then could take that friend ID go to the person's MySpace page and get all sorts of information about that person and have full information about that person as well as their browsing habits. And that was one of the things the FTC claimed was not adequately disclosed, a kind of behavioral advertising. All right, now, behavioral advertising came to the fore three or four years ago, and since then, there have been all sorts of reports and initiatives in Washington related not just to the narrow behavioral advertising, but also to data privacy in general, all sparked by behavioral advertising. The Commerce Department Green Paper, Federal Trade Commission reports, the recent White House Consumer Bill of Rights. So let me go over some of these in very summary form. First of all, the industry has tried to respond to concerns about behavioral advertising by coming up with what they call the Digital Advertising Alliance and a program for self-regulation self of online behavioral advertising. Essentially, the idea is that every time an ad network posts a behavioral ad on someone's uh, uh, website, there will be, that will be identified using this little uh, triangle and little i symbol. And then clicking on the symbol or the words next to it will take you to either pop-up boxes or websites that tell the consumer what is being done in terms of behavioral advertising and give the consumer some opt-out choices. Initially, the Federal Trade Commission was skeptical of this program. Most recently in their report in March, they've, they said that they think the program has a lot of credit and will probably be the best way to regulate this field. Now, in addition to these initial uh, industry initiatives, 
Well, there's been a lot of attention focused on data privacy generally that I think has led to the other impulses in Washington, initiatives in Washington. The Wall Street Journal series called What They Know last year was something of a sensationalized series that raised some real concerns about data privacy and whether it was adequately disclosed. In addition, around the same time, researchers primarily at Berkeley and Carnegie Mellon have come up with a number of reports that questions whether consumers are getting adequate disclosure of all the things going on when they visit websites and allow uh, cookies to be placed on their computer. Uh, this uh, Berkeley study about um, flash cookies and how flash cookies actually respawn or regenerate cookies that people might have deleted was one of the leading uh, things that happened there. Another thing that I think has fed the debate has been the concern about data linkages, namely the, the ability to tie together different databases, kind of like what happened in the MySpace case. MySpace just got a simple little identifier, a friend ID, from its behavioral advertising tracking, but it was then able to go to the friend ID's website, get all sorts of information on that person, and have a detailed profile. Even when data is anonymized, as in the anonymous data that Netflix released in connection with its Netflix prize program trying to develop a better algorithm, um, it was that anonymized data can actually be pierced through and linked with specific individuals. And that indeed happened in the, in the Netflix case, and a study at the University of Texas at Austin showed that the anonymized data could be combined with publicly available data to create actually very rich uh, databases, even showing particular users renting particular movies. Uh, and finally, the last development that I think has fed this whole problem has been uh, class actions. The, the class action lawyers read the Berkeley and Carnegie Mellon reports. They read the Wall Street Journal series. They see the problems with combining uh, databases, and they've sprung into action. They've sued over the failure to disclose flash cookies. They've sued over failure to get adequate uh, consent, inadequate privacy policies, and so forth. And again, the MySpace case is an example. That was a Federal Trade Commission enforcement action. But just as in the class actions, the FTC was complaining about inadequate privacy disclosure. And as a consequence, with the settlement that MySpace entered into yesterday, MySpace is going to have to have 20 years of, of uh, compliance review. They're going to be uh, committed to have third-party uh, expert privacy audits of their privacy practices every other year for the next 20 years. So the consequences of these actions based on inadequate privacy policies can be quite severe. The Google Buzz example is one more example, and then I want to get into what's, what's happened as a result. Uh, Google Buzz was Google's first attempt at a uh, uh, social media program, but they started it up while they had given users disclosure of what would happen. The disclosure was somewhat buried in the fine print and the ability to opt out was buried in the fine print. So people complained about that. Cla uh, uh, FTC actions were brought, class actions were brought, and eventually there was a settlement. But this shows the, the real sensitivity of issues uh, in this area. Uh, the regulators believe and the class action lawyers believe you need full consent even when very logical things were, were being done. Google thought they were being very helpful and people who are already their customers get set up in Google Buzz without a lot of action on behalf of the customers. Uh, they did have disclosure in the terms and conditions, but it might not have been apparent to everybody. So the, these, uh, these, these cases have led to a lot of issues. Uh, one more interesting example, I guess I said this was the last one was the last one, but this is really interesting. This is a case where something called referrer header leakage uh, or divulged search queries is an issue. A few years ago, the federal government subpoenaed Google and said, we want to find out what search queries your consumers are making to you. And Google fought that subpoena very, very hard. The case was Google versus Gonzalez. Gonzalez was Alberto Gonzalez, the Attorney General of the United States at the time. And Google was successful in fighting the subpoena because they said, the search queries that go between our customers and ourselves are confidential Consumers expect them to be confidential. We're not going to give them up even to a U.S. government subpoena. 
Well, the latest case, Gayos versus Google, that came out about a year a year ago, is a plaintiff saying, well, wait a minute, Google, you claim that those search queries were confidential when the U.S. government subpoenaed them, but you are voluntarily giving those as part of other data that you provide to search engine optimization companies because the entire uh, pages viewed URLs that you give to the search engine optimization companies include the search queries within it. So that's yet another example of the kind of class actions that are coming about. Now, all of this attention has led to the actions in Washington at the Commerce Department, the FTC, the White House, and Congress. And let me go over those very briefly. Uh, the White House uh, came, into action, came into this uh, fight uh, a few months ago in February and released its Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights. It would like to have that a seven-point Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights enacted by Congress and enforceable by the FTC. It's fairly broad, though, and obviously if such a broad bill were passed, the FTC would have broad discretion in enforcing it. But the White House then said, well, to give businesses more specificity and more assurance about what they're doing, we want to have a multi-stakeholder process in which each business, each industry will work together develop its own voluntary industry codes of conduct for privacy practices. Then, if you follow the industry practice, the industry code of conduct for your industry, that would be a safe harbor, and the FTC would never go after you on the overall basic bill of uh, consumer privacy bill of rights. If you don't have an industry code of conduct, however, then you're subject to the uh, broader uh, privacy bill of rights. And incidentally, this could have impact beyond the privacy field. Uh, Daniel Weitzner, the Deputy Chief Technology Officer for Internet Policy at the White House, gave a speech last week, and he said this dual system, the broad bill and the more narrow uh, code of conducts, which were safe harbors, is going to be the model for other Internet policy issues that the White House takes, uh, particularly in the areas of intellectual property and cybersecurity. Now, um, the Commerce Department is involved because it is the one that would actually implement and oversee the White House proposals, particularly the multi-stakeholder process and the development of industry codes of conduct. Uh, that, by the way, is Cameron Carey, the general counsel of the uh, Commerce Department, who is also the brother of Senator John Kerry. The, FD, the, the Commerce Department is also working on harmonizing U.S. privacy rules with European Union privacy rules. As many of you know, the European Union Database, uh, uh, Database Protection Directive has been uh, a problem for a lot of multinational companies. Vivian Redding, the European Union Commissioner who's in charge of that, has been very active recently and is trying to uh, transform the Database Protection, protection Directive in, from a directive into EU legislation. And she just said last week she expects that to occur by next summer. So there's a lot of work that Commerce is doing with that so this will not be as painful for U.S. companies as it has been. The Federal Trade Commission issued two very detailed reports on data privacy in general, in addition to its earlier report on behavioral advertising. Now, the pictures I put on this slide are kind of confusing, but I think they're meant to be confusing. They are the FTC's view of all the different little arrows and, and uh, data flows involving individuals, and they attempt to show that the poor little individual is at the center of this very, very confusing uh, exchange of data about him. And they think that the old notice and choice system for database protection is outmoded, and there's a need for a totally new model for privacy protection, which they call privacy by design. Uh, if you want to learn more about this, by the way, and you're really into this area, uh, uh, half an hour after our seminar, you can log into the Senate Commerce Commission, Senate Commerce Committee hearings because FTC Chairman John Leibowitz is going to be speaking today at the hearing on this subject, and Cameron Carey is also going to be on that uh, program this afternoon. Now, the FTC and its privacy by design framework wants privacy considered at every stage of every transaction. They do admit that there are certain kinds of transactions where specific privacy disclosures are not needed that the context of the interaction tells you that the consumer already understands what is being done. Product fulfillment being 
the best example because the consumer gives his name and address and credit card number in order to buy a product, and obviously that's needed for those purposes. There's a lot of other purposes. They have acknowledged this context of the interaction, uh, permissive, uh, permits the transaction to proceed without special privacy disclosures. And in their recent report in March, they uh, backed off of an earlier position and said there may be more situations than just these where the context of the interaction allows it to proceed without special disclosures. Beyond those uh, exemptions, however, they want specific disclosures made every time a consumer, consumer data is used. And I think many people in this process fear that their new privacy by design framework will be so tight that it will inhibit many marketing uses of data and databases that are commonplace today and the businesses feel are valuable to them. Now, the FTC's specific emphasis, according to its report in March, is on mobile devices. Uh, they're particularly frustrated at the idea that mobile disclosures will go on for 67 iPhone screens, which nobody ever reads. So it's probably going to become standardized, simplified disclosures for mobile devices. They've also targeted data brokers, and they believe that data brokers, because they no longer have the relationship with the consumer, they buy the data from the company that had the original relationship with the consumer, are too far from the uh, consumer's control, and they want to give consumers control over information that data brokers have. Um, the FTC originally in its uh, December 2010 report said they want to do not track legislation. It's not totally clear what that means. It's probably go ahead and track, but do not follow up on the information you have from tracking. Um, they have backed off on that, though, recently. In their March 2012 report, they said they think the self-regulatory program is probably going to be sufficient, and they're thus backing off of any new do-not-track legislation, such as the one that Representative Speer has proposed. In Congress, the leading bill on privacy is a Kerry McCain bill uh, by Cameron Kerry's brother. It would... Uh, uh, create a new category of sensitive data, which would have to be handled especially carefully, it would require more robust privacy notices, and most importantly, it would have this concept of data minimization. And that the idea there is that data would only be used for whatever purpose it was originally given. Uh, that's a, a problem for many marketing companies because they think that one of the benefits of the digital age is that when you get data for one purpose, you know something, you can use that in your marketing efforts for other purposes and, and really benefit from that. Data minimization could chill a lot of that. Um, other legislative efforts, Representative Spears do not track bill, which does not seem to be going anywhere. Representative Cliff Stearns of Florida, who has a key post in the House, has a fairly business-friendly bill that would actually approve the Digital Advertising Alliance uh, program for behavioral advertising and generally follow an opt-out rule. Representative Bobby Rush, uh, who before the last election held an important position in the House, had a more aggressive bill that would allow actual private rights of action for data privacy and I guess be the Class Action Full Employment uh, Act. Now, just to sum up uh, and give you ideas as to what may be concerns for you and your business as this legislation and regulation goes forward. One of the top concerns, it seems to me, is that all of these bills and regulatory efforts have been focused on consumers, but if the same kind of restrictions on business-to-business -business use of data were imposed as with consumers, it would be a, a require drastic cutbacks in a lot, of, a lot of business use of information. Cameron Carey in the, in the Commerce Department uh, said that he only wants it to cover consumer uses, and the uh, the bill by Senator Kerry and by Cliff Stearns also provide some exemptions. That's something a trade associate I'm involved with is lobbying very hard for a business of business exemption. The um, data minimization, as I mentioned, is a real concern for people who want to make uh, use of, uh, uh, of use of data. There are some compromises that are possible. There simply could be more robust notices to consumers about how their data could be used, and again, some ability of consumers to inspect or correct data. That might be a compromise. Uh, finally, the ability to merge data from different databases is a real concern. 
The concern spread comes from the consumer area where people feel that data about them will be combined with Facebook profiles, so it will be a total database on everything about that consumer. These bills are designed to pre uh, prevent that, yet on the other hand, as I mentioned on the slide, data combinations can be very useful in marketing, analysis, competition, other business uses, so we expect business concerns to really lobby and try to get uh, these provisions minimized and, and uh, or at least confined to the consumer world. And what, all right, that's all I have for now on data tracking, and uh, I'm going to turn the microphone over to my partner, Rob Kamensky, who's going to tell you all you need to know about those terrible data breach laws. Thank you, Mark. Uh, as Mark said, my name is Rob Kamensky, and I'm a partner in uh, Thompson Coburn's Corporate and Securities Practice Group. Uh, today, I'm going to be discussing data breach. While it's difficult to cover this topic in a short time, I will try to provide as much information as possible. Uh, we are in the midst of an information explosion, and we have been for some time now. Wireless networks are everywhere, and it's just not only computers that are able to hold huge amounts of data, it's the nature of the data itself. Today, our medical information, financial information, spending habits, medical information, and other kinds of personally identifiable information is all stored on computers throughout the world. Here's a short roadmap of what I'll be covering. Uh, first, I'm going to relate a few war stories, then run through some background data, talk a little bit about the legal regime, and then lastly, preparation and prevention. Last year, Mid-State Medical Center misplaced a hard drive. This hard drive contained personally identifiable information for about 93,000 people. The information included patients' names, addresses, birth dates, social security numbers, and medical records. While the hospital had no reason to believe that any personal information on the lost hard drive had been misused, MidState offered those affected two years of identity protection. Now, from my determination, Identity protection costs about $30 per year, uh, so for two years it's $60, times 93000 equals about $5.5 million. And that's just for the identity protection piece. Uh, at this point, we have not heard of any other additional lawsuits on this case, but $5.5 million for a, a data breach uh, is right up there in the average. TJX Companies, I'm sure you heard about this when it made the news, is the owner of about 2,500 stores, uh, including TJ Maxx and Marshalls. At least 94 million Visa and MasterCard accounts may have been exposed in a data breach. Uh, it's, it's been reported the break-in gave hackers undeterred and undetected access to their central databases for about a year and a half. Uh, investigations concluded that hackers intercepted unencrypted Wi-Fi signals at two Miami Mar area Marshall stores. So two stores had unencrypted Wi-Fi, resulting in a total of $64 million worth of known actual costs. The top of the triangle reflects monetary awards from court cases. That's $23 million. Then other known costs, and these are reported costs, of $41 million. So again, $64 million for the cost of this data breach. And just the other day, bad news out of Boston. According to the Boston Office of Consumer Affairs and Business Registration, nearly half, I'll say that again, nearly half of Massachusetts residents have had their personal information lost or stolen as a result of about 1,800 data breaches over the last four years. Uh, extrapolating this data, leads to a frightening result. And in 2009, Heartland Payment Systems, a bank card payment processor for many small merchants, uh, mostly restaurants, retailers, and the like, experienced a data breach which may have led to the theft of more than 100 million credit and debit card accounts, making it one of the largest breaches ever reported. Well, as you can see in the lower left of the slide, data breach risks can also include shareholder litigation. However, Heartland was lucky this time. And late last year, the Defense Department was hit by a $5 billion class action lawsuit filed uh, on behalf of military families and the millions of TRICARE beneficiaries whose personal information 
uh, was contained on unencrypted tapes stolen from a car parked uh, for one day in downtown San Antonio. The lesson? Don't park your car in downtown San Antonio. No, actually, the lesson really is make sure all data is encrypted. It has been reported that each of these companies has experienced a data breach of one sort or another. In other words, you are not alone. And now we're going to do a poll. Um, and the question is, for those attending, have you experienced a recent data breach or an attempted data breach? We're going to leave the polls open for a minute. Now remember, this is a small sample, which is, which is obviously changing as people are continuing to vote. Um, but it's interesting, 42% of those attending this, uh, this seminar have reported yes, a recent data breach or an attempted data breach. 31% no, 27% don't know. Now, typically, the don't knows are people who just aren't in a position to know the technical aspects of whether an attempted data breach occurred, or they simply really do not know. Um, so I think that's very important to note. Um, and it's also notable to, we're going to go back to that other slide. Uh, June 2011 Poneman Institute survey finds 90% of businesses fell victim to cybersecurity breach at least once in the past 12 months. As the chair of the FTC has reported to Congress, it's important to note, however, that there is no such thing as perfect security and breaches can happen even when a company has taken every reasonable precaution. As this slide illustrates, data breach costs continue to increase. In 2005, the average cost was 138 per compromised record. Uh, in 2009, the average cost was $204 per compromised record. And recently released 2011 data pegs the amount at $214 per compromised record. These costs are expected to rise. And looking at the root cause of data breach, Single major cause, negligence in 40% of the instances. Negligence includes, includes hacked IT system, a lack of security, a lost laptop or hard drive, unsecured website login, and employee downloads of company data. In fact, just the other day, uh, we had a client who reported the data breach, a, uh, an employee who was uh, given notice of termination, uh, went on their system and downloaded uh, an incredible amount of data emailed that to themselves uh, very rapidly, and uh, now we are dealing with that breach. As of last month, the Open Security Foundation reported 369 total incidents affecting over, oh, I think it's 130 million records. Of these incidents, about 45% impacted businesses, which include top three of hospitality, retailers, and financial institutions. 29% impacted medical industry, 15% government, and 13% education. I looked today, and as of today, there have been 543 reported breaches year to date. Looks like we're on a roll here to increase the amount of breaches over last year. And organizations are also experiencing multiple successful attacks against their networks, consistent with the Poneman survey. A Juniper Network study showed that 59% of respondents say their organization's network security has been successfully breached at least twice over the past 12 months. 10% do not know how many breaches there have been, and 90% of the organizations in the study have had at least one breach. Again, the lesson here is you are not alone. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the legislation that's out there, state data breach laws. Um, it's important to note that California has, uh, has been the custom, leads the way. Uh, in 2002, California became the first state to enact legislation directed toward notification after a security data breach. Uh, the law, commonly known as Senate Bill 1386, or 1386, requires companies that store personal information data to notify California consumers of a security breach if the company knows or reasonably believes that unencrypted data about the consumer has been subject to a security data breach. Uh, 1386 began the chain of events that 
resulted in many states, in fact most states now, uh, requiring notification to a person whose personal information was accessed uh, without authorization. This slide presents an overview of the most common definition of data breach. Uh, this is found in many of the state data security laws, and they define data breach as personal information in unencrypted form accessed by or improperly disclosed to an unauthorized person. In other words, unauthorized disclosure of confidential information. Now, I think it's important to go into the definition a little further to see what personal information means. Personal information means an individual's name and one of the following, social security number, account number, a state ID or driver's license number, uh, or credit card number. So, in other words, these specific state data security laws have very particular definitions, and it's important to note that during the pendency of a data breach investigation, whether or not you're required to comply with the particular state law. State laws do vary, and I'll give you an example. We had a client who sold a computer at a garage sale. They decided to be uh, ecologically conscious and sell off uh, old computer equipment. Unfortunately, the client left unencrypted data on the computer. Uh, they realized that, of course, after uh, they had sold the computer off and we uh, got the call and we had to go through a lot of trouble to get the computer back. However, had the data been encrypted, it would not have been a data breach. A typical act is the Illinois Personal Information Protection uh, Act, which was effective uh, January 1, 2006. This act provides two main directives, notice and disposal. Any data collector that owns personal information concerning an Illinois resident shall notify the resident at no charge that there has been a breach of the security of the system data following discovery or notification of a breach. Uh, there's a variety of uh, materials that are, need to be included in that notice, but that's beyond the scope of this discussion. But we'd be glad to, uh, to go over that if someone has a particular question at the end. A person must, uh, the second directive is a person must dispose of personal information in a manner that renders the information unreadable, unusable, and undecipherable. So for paper documents, they could be redacted or burned or shredded, and electronic media may be destroyed or erased so that personal information cannot practically be read or reconstructed. I, there's a, an example. One of the, the issues that comes up is, well, we have a state law that applies, but other states don't apply. And I think the choice point example is really a, a very illustrative of this uh, point. So ChoicePoint, one of the largest data aggregators and resellers of personal information in the country, and they discovered a data breach in late 2004. And in 2004, the only state with a data breach law on the books was California. So what did ChoicePoint do? They did what their lawyers told them to do, and that is notify the 35,000 California residents as required by California law that there was a data breach. Well, unfortunately, you sort of opened Pandora's box there, and the other 110,000 U.S. citizens who weren't California residents said, hey, what about us? So while it may appear that your company is not required to provide notice under a particular law, you may find that once the cat is out of the bag, the fact that notice is not required may not matter. In addition to state data security laws, one must consider the alphabet soup of federal data security laws, such as GLB, FACTA, HIPAA, HITECH, and of course, FTC requirements. The risks include the typical risks, of course, litigation exposure, contractual liability, customer or employee privacy expectations, and unwanted publicity. Now one of my uh, favorite quotes from Bobby Knight, most people have the will to win, few have the will to prepare to win. So here's where we're talking about preparation and prevention. The FTC has provided certain guidance, and that includes take stock, know what personal information is maintained, 
scale down, keep only what is necessary, and this is where I would also recommend that uh, each company implement and use a document retention and destruction policy. Lock it, so in other words, protect the information, pitch it, properly dispose of information, and plan ahead. Plan ahead, prepare a breach notification plan. The breach notification plan should identify the members of the response team who also should be involved in the development of the plan. This plan is ultimately your roadmap on how to respond to a data breach. So this is what you do in the event of a data breach. You pull out the plan, you bring the players together, and you run through the plan. It's a good idea to practice this plan. As part of the plan, companies should also adopt industry best practices, such as establishing solid data security policies and procedures, uh, investing in encryption technology, uh, including ensuring that portable data devices, such of course as uh, hard drives, USB memory sticks, are encrypted. These are available now at a fairly reasonable cost, so that's an important factor. Uh, minimize personal information collected and retained. Establish and monitor access control. Uh, require vendors and subcontractors to safeguard confidential information and consider insurance issues such as cyber liability insurance. Uh, lastly, education and practice, and what that means is educate your staff and practice the plan. Ultimately, if and when in doubt about these requirements, it's uh, advisable to seek the counsel of consultants and legal experts to assist. Practical lessons. If and when an incident occurs, this is where you pull out the pre-prepared plan. There is a card that's going to come out with your CLE certificates uh, that's called How to Respond to a Data Breach that we've put together for you, and I think this will help in the event that something happens. But here is the basics of what, uh, what you should do. First of all, you want to determine if a breach occurred. You've got to look at the definition of data breach for the applicable jurisdiction or jurisdictions and make a determination whether it actually is a data breach. Identify the nature, extent, and, and scope of the breach. Uh, identify legal obligations triggered by the breach. And of course, provide required notices. Many times these notices need to go out to more than just the affected consumer, uh, such as government authorities like the Attorney General, state consumer agencies, and even the media. Uh, take remediation and mitigation measures um, and cooperate with government investigations. Uh, as an illustration of a government investigation uh, issue, uh, HHS penalized Signet Health with a $3 million penalty for failing to cooperate with authorities. So if you add these to the various costs, this adds up quite quickly. In conclusion, consequences of a data breach can be severe. From the cost, the threat to reputation, as well as lawsuits, it is best to understand the threat, acknowledge it, and prepare for the eventuality that you too will, or may, experience a data breach. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I would like to hand the mic over to Mike Duffy, who will be presenting on workplace data and computer use policies. And uh, we are, of course, looking forward to your questions at the end of the presentation. Thanks, Rob. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mike Duffy, and I am a member of Thompson Coburn's Labor and Employment Department. I'll be talking in our final segment today about privacy issues as they affect employee workplace rights. From the employee's viewpoint, uh, they generally have the expectation of a right of privacy in the workplace unless the company's business is directly implicated. And they may be right or wrong, depending on the circumstances. So as such, there is always a continuing tension between the employee's beliefs, whether rightly or wrongly, and what their rights actually are. For example, certain information, such as medical information connected with FMLA leave, HIPAA, and the ADA, is protected from disclosure to unauthorized persons under federal law, and also, while pre-employment medical exams and drug tests are permissible in most circumstances, uh, their results are subject to disclosure limitations by the employer. State laws, on the other hand, vary from the overly specific to the virtually non-existent in terms of employee workplace privacy. 
However, apart from legislation, most states recognize common law invasion of privacy claims by employees for improper employer intrusion uh, into an employee's privacy. Of course, these claims are important because they can often carry the potential for large punitive damage claims. Recently, the U.S. Supreme Court in 2010 addressed the issue of workplace privacy rights in the City of Ontario versus Kwan case. That case involved a supervisor's search of employer-issued texting devices uh, to determine why it was that the employees were using far too much data than was originally planned for in the data plan which was purchased from the carrier. Turned out, employees were sending each other sexually explicit or other improper messages during working time, far more so than workplace messages. Uh, discipline followed as, predictably, litigation. Ultimately, the matter wound up before the U.S. Supreme Court, which held that there was no Fourth Amendment invasion of privacy claim by the employees against the city uh, since the employer's search was reasonable under the circumstances. Uh, that is, it was for a work-related purpose, and the search was not excessive. And although this was a Fourth Amendment case, which dealt with public employees, it does provide some guidance for private sector employers as to how courts will balance employee rights with an employer's right to conduct workplace searches. So obviously the question arises, should an employer have a workplace privacy policy to address these conflicting rights? And the answer, obviously, is yes, absolutely. So that being the case, what should such a policy contain? Well, while there's no single template for a privacy policy, there are some things that you can say from a general point of view about what a privacy policy should have. First, it should set clear expectations for the employee's privacy rights in the workplace. Employees should be told that the employer can and will monitor computer and telephone usage or other devices given by the employer to the employee. Uh, the policy should specify areas, physical areas, that the employer reserves the right to search, uh, such as employee lockers, desks, uh, employee personal property such as purses, lunch boxes, briefcases, and the like, and uh, in some cases even the employee's car if it's parked in the employer's parking lot. Uh, and finally, the uh, employee should acknowledge receipt of the policy in writing, and that should be placed in the employee's personnel file. You may need to have that uh, recognition sometime in the future should the employee claim that his or her privacy rights have been invaded. Now we're going to shift the focus uh, to the issue of what's been termed social media. Things such as Facebook, MySpace, LinkedIn, Twitter, blogs, and email. And irrespective of the type of social media at issue, you can be sure of two things. Uh, A, your employees are using this media both on and off the job. And B, they're probably talking about your company or their coworkers at some point. Let's look at a couple of examples. In this particular Facebook uh, posting, uh, you can see that Tim here is uh, not particularly a fan of Whirlpool. Uh, he's made some several critical comments about their business practices uh, for everybody to uh, see on this site. Here's another example, uh, and this one's a little even more clear from the employee perspective, why I hate working at Target and a lot of postings from people who seem to share that same point of view in some great detail. Well, these kinds of postings raise a number of questions for employers. First, should the company care at all about these kinds of postings? Uh, what rights or obligations do employees in the company have regarding these kinds of social media postings? And most obviously, from the employer's point of view, can you discipline an employee for making postings such as these, especially if uh, you happen to be target and uh, some of these folks work for you? Well, one example of some issues affecting employers regarding employee postings and social media uh, is the FTC's endorsement and testimonial guidelines, which were adopted uh, within the last few years. In order to comply with these guidelines, an employer must have a policy that states that when its employees are posting comments favorable to the company or that may be negative to a competitor. They must identify themselves as an employee of the company 
and indicate that these opinions are their own and not those of the company, or the Federal Trade Commission will presume that the employee is in fact speaking for the company, and this can result in some significant penalties to the employer. So apart from general employer privacy policies, these types of situations and others strongly suggest that there's a need for an employer to have a social media policy in its toolbox. What should such a policy cover? Well, first, and this may seem obvious, it should be in writing, and it should be communicated to all employees so that they understand very clearly what is covered by the policy and what isn't. Uh, the policy should also define things which the employee can, and should, or cannot do in terms of social media and other Internet postings regarding the company and its, uh, and its workforce, uh, which may even include postings by the employee apart from the workplace. Uh, further, the policy should clearly spell out the type of FTC disclosure uh, that we talked about before that the employee must engage in. And finally, the employer should, as in all employment policies, be consistent in the application of the policy. Don't play favorites in enforcement uh, and monitor employee compliance to be sure that you are, in fact, enforcing the policy. Next question is, are there limits to the employer's ability to control what employees do in terms of social media postings? Well, as we'll see in the next few seconds, our friends at the National Labor Relations Board think that there are limits to this. And if you think, uh, as one of the 93% of, uh, of uh, employers in the uh, economy, that you're not unionized, uh, that you don't have to worry about the National Labor Relations Board, think again. That agency's current enforcement efforts are directed precisely at companies like yours, those of which who do not have a union, but which the National Labor Relations Board thinks you should. So in 2011, and again in January of 2012, the National Labor Relations Board's general counsel, who is their chief prosecutor, for those of you haven't had the pleasure of dealing with that agency, uh, issued a lengthy set of guidelines for employers' social media policies. Here's some kinds of uh, examples of some kinds of policies which the board's general counsel thinks violate the law. For example, policies which forbid, quote, disparaging comments about the employer. Uh, policies which tell employees to discuss workplace issues in, quote, an appropriate manner without defining what that means, uh, precluding employee discussion of matters which are defamatory or harassing regarding coworkers or the company. And they even went so far that the general counsel was clear that an employer's disclaimer, which intended to tell employees that the company was not trying to violate the, the National Labor Relations Act in its social media policy was not enough to save what the board believed was an overly broad and unlawful policy. And if you're thinking that these objections may seem silly, and they probably are uh, in, in, in some people's opinions, they do stem from the Labor Board's long-term way of analyzing employer handbook policies, which might, and I have that word in quotes, chill an employee's right to organize under the act or engage in what they call protected concerted activity with their coworkers. So given all of these restrictions, what does the general counsel think you can do? Well, this is where the guidelines fall a little bit short, uh, but they do give a couple of examples that employers can hang their hat on to know when it is they're not violating the law. For example, uh, policies which specifically outline the type of improper posting which the employer forbids, such as uh, something which could violate the company's existing racial or sexual harassment policies. And you can see from this first example uh, a little bit wordy and a little bit extensive, but this was the kind of detail that the Labor Board General Counsel required to have the employer show that it wasn't trying to curtail lawful activity, just trying to get at unlawful or improper activity that the board believed the employer could lawfully regulate. Also, uh, employers can prohibit posting of confidential and proprietary information or information which is necessary to comply with laws such as the securities laws and the like. However, 
be very careful in this regard because if the employer determines that workplace policies or employees' wages, for example, uh, are, quote, confidential uh, and they shouldn't be discussed with coworkers or with third parties, that is something that the Labor Board for many, many years has forbidden as unlawful uh, and a violation of the National Labor Relations Act. So you can see the more particular uh, that the employer is about the type of conduct that it's prohibiting, the more likely it is that the Labor Board may go along with its legality. So what would be the takeaway uh, from this for you to avoid NLRB scrutiny of your social media policies? Well, first, you should reasonably tailor the policy to target clearly improper, illegal, or immoral postings that don't involve what the government calls, quote, Section 7 rights, that is, the right to engage in what they call protected concerted activity for either the organization of a union or for objecting to or protesting employer policies or, or workplace practices or employer or supervisory conduct, which employees may not particularly care for or want to change. Uh, also, it's okay for the employer to prohibit disclosure of confidential or proprietary information, again, so long as things like wages or workplace benefits are not considered to be, quote, confidential. Uh, you can prohibit vulgar, obscene, sexually or racially harassing postings, but in this respect, as, as ridiculous it may, as it may be, I would err on the side of using the kinds of wordy and detailed examples that the Labor Board has approved to make sure that your policy isn't struck down through some inadvertence on your part. Uh, also, in particular, I would avoid either having the policy read this way or applied in the fashion of disciplining employees for, quote, group-based complaints. In other words, complaints where an employee is seeking the support of his or her coworkers to protest employers' lack of wage increases or poor benefit packages or the way that the employee believes that the employees are being mistreated or the like. Anything that smacks of that kind of of, of appeal to coworkers or discussion of what coworkers do and don't like is clearly the protected activity that the board is seeking uh, to protect and to keep employers from regulating. And finally, although the board doesn't like uh, having disclaimers, I would certainly use one anyway, but it's not going to protect what might be an un uh, overly broad and invalid policy. And finally, apart from social media, don't neglect your normal confidentiality policies and practices. Uh, these are going to become important should you ever be involved in a covenant not to compete situation or uh, a, a case of disclosure of trade secrets or appropriation of trade secrets uh, by a probably soon-to-be former employee. Uh, employees need to be reminded that these policies are also implicated and involved in the social media policy that you may have. Uh, also, and this goes with or without social media policies, you want to make sure that you control access to confidential or proprietary information so that a prospective uh, defendant in a suit for an injunction down the road can't argue that this so-called confidential information you're trying to protect has been freely disseminated uh, throughout the workplace and it's really not confidential and you may have a judge ultimately say that's the case and deprive you of the right to protect it. Uh, and certainly in this regard, pursue the people who violate these policies so that you can avoid a contention sometime in the future that you may have waived your rights to protect uh, your confidential or proprietary information uh, by sitting on your rights and not acting to protect it the last several times that employees have helped themselves to it. So that will conclude the, this portion of the program, and we'll open it up for any questions. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, we do have the Q&A button. You can tap on and type in your questions. That's the way we need to get the questions from you, and we'd love to have them. Mike, we do have one question that's right out of the recent headlines for you. Should we ask our prospective employees for their Facebook passwords? That's a good question, Mark. Glad you asked it. Uh, a lot of employers do have a policy of doing this sort of thing, and currently, except in the state of Maryland, uh, there's nothing illegal about doing that, and it probably doesn't violate uh, privacy laws if you ask it in the right way. But having said that, there's a clear legislative trend toward uh, 
forbidding employers from doing this. As I said, Maryland very recently adopted a law. Illinois, California, several other states are currently considering such laws. I predict this is going to be sort of the trendy hot law of 2012, and a number of states, if they haven't already done so, are going to be adopting these laws in the next few months.